So uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Uh, Pacifici. Dr. Pacifici is uh, Chief Scientific Officer of CHDI. Uh, this is a privately held not-for-profit not organization, and it really is, I think, a blueprint for some of the things that we can do in stem cell approaches. It's a biotech approach to uh, rapidly identify and transfer drugs that may offer the opportunity to pre prevent or slow the progression of Huntington's disease. He was formerly the site director, chief scientific officer for Eli Lilly, uh, worked there in the uh, Research Triangle Park, and uh, his responsibilities included oversight of the company's uh, global screening and uh, quantitative biology efforts. Prior to joining uh, Lilly, he was vice president of Discovery Technologies as, at Zencore, which is another privately held biotechno biotechnology company specializing in developing rationally designed protein therapeutics. He spent over a decade at Amgen, where he held positions of various levels of responsibility, uh, leadership for their automation high throughput screening. So he's really had a uh, great uh, experience in just the kinds of approaches that I think you'll see later on uh, may be possible as we uh, develop uh, new approaches involving stem cells for, uh, for Huntington's disease. So without uh, any further ado, uh, I'll turn the uh, mic here over to Dr. Pacifici. Thanks so much for uh, the introduction and for really what I think is a remarkable opportunity to speak uh, to, to this group on something that um, I obviously feel very passionate about, and that is the potential utility of stem cells in enabling our Huntington's drug discovery efforts. So what I was tasked with this morning is introducing HD um, as, uh, as a disease and tell you a little bit about how we might utilize this very powerful and very promising um, technology. So what is Huntington disease? Well, this is something that um, uh, was named back in 1872. So this is a disease that um, has been around in, in name for quite some time and uh, was immediately stigmatized as something that uh, sort of really puzzled the people who uh, were around affected individuals, largely because of the involuntary movements, because of an intoxicated uh, appearance. People were... Um, uh, stigmatized and, and, and ostracized a bit. And I think that we now realize that, um, thanks to an awful lot of science, that this is a neurodegenerative disorder. This is a progressive disease that uh, tragically is, is always fatal. And it's one of the diseases that has benefited from, um, as some of my uh, previous speakers have already mentioned, an awful lot of very focused and well-coordinated efforts that led to the cloning, the positional cloning, first of a marker and later of the gene in, in 1993. So we now know what the cause of this disease is, and we know an awful lot about the progression of it and uh, the description of it. And most of the Huntington's cases are late onset, around between the ages of 30 and 50. So, uh, Imagine for a moment that um, you're diagnosed with Huntington um, around 40 years old. Uh, you've watched one of your parents die of the disease, and um, it's not a pleasant thing to watch, and you now know that that's going to happen to you. You know that you have about 10 years of survival in front of you, and uh, at the age of 40, chances are you've already procreated, and you have to communicate to your family that chances are half of your children have the disease as well. So this is something that is devastating, not only from a medical perspective, but from a social and family perspective as well. The pathology is very striking. Um, the pictures that you see here represent post-mortem pictures of a healthy brain on the top and of a HD-affected person on, on the bottom. What you see is a striking loss of a very specific region within the brain called the striatum and even more specifically, a subset of neurons called the medium spiny neurons. So this is something that is very focal and very, um, very clear. And the consequences of the loss of that particular type of neuron is, um, is very widespread. So think of all the worst aspects of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS all rolled into one disease. Very severe uh, behavioral and emotional problems. Uh, people suffer from, from depression, mood swings, uh, a lot of suicidal ideation even before they know that they have the disease. 
cognitive deficits, so there's a loss of executive function. It becomes very difficult to conduct a uh, productive life. And the most um, outwardly manifested and, and, and common description of the disease is related to the motor effects, these involuntary movements that go from uh, a dance-like movement, that's where the, the name Korea came from, down to a very dystonic and, um, and locked-in position towards the end, which affects everything from their ability to take care of themselves, uh, dress themselves, eat, and conduct a, a productive life. As of right now, uh, there are no known therapies for Huntington disease, so this is a tremendous unmet medical need. It's often referred to as a family disease, and um, the reason is is that it's autosomal dominant inheritance. So, uh, unlike some of the recessive diseases or some of the sporadic diseases like Alzheimer's and, and ALS, this is something that affects all aspects of the family. So everybody is at risk, and 50% of each generation will get the disease. So no generation is spared. There's no dormancy or, or skipping. And tragically, um, although most of the onset is between 30 and 50, there is a, a, a paternal inheritance pattern that leads to a juvenile form of the disease. And you can actually see Nancy Wexler, one of the pioneers in this area, who is taking care of um, a patient down in Venezuela who is affected at a very early age. So even though we think of this as a rare disease, there's this devastating concentration of the pathology and of its effects um, in individual families. So the culprit here is a single gene. It's the Huntington gene that was cloned in, in 1993. So this was a landmark scientific accomplishment. Um, and despite the fact that the gene has now been around for well over a decade, it's proven very difficult to come up with therapies to treat this disorder. So the gene is very large and still of unknown function. And the reason why I bring it up is because it has some interesting implications for why stem cell research is so important within the Huntington field. So despite the fact that the Huntington gene is fairly ubiquitously expressed all over the body at all times, it's only those medium spiny neurons that really seem to be affected. So one of the things that we really need to be careful about in our drug screening effort is to put the Huntington gene, the mutated gene, into a cellular context where it can recapitulate the human pathophysiology. And so what we'd like to do is put it into <clears throat> a cell background that looks an awful lot like the neurons that um, actually exist exhibit the, the pathophysiology. So what I tried to do, I'm a drug discovery guy. I had to have one slide in here that, that spoke to these issues. So what I tried to do is sort of describe the disease and what the implications are for, for drug discovery. So it's progressive and fatal, which means we're looking at a chronic therapy. We need to develop drugs that are really safe, well tolerated, because people are going to be on this drug for the rest of their lives. And chances are, if we can treat presymptomatic people, they'll be on it from a very early age. There is a genetic test, and so we can figure out who has the disease. Interestingly enough, people don't get tested these days very often because there's not a lot of upside to doing that. Our hope is that you know, once some therapies or at least trials for therapies are in place, there may be a larger population that we can access presymptomatically. And because of the, the presence of a gene, unlike the sporadic diseases, you can contemplate a preventative prophylactic strategy. There's an inverse correlation between the severity or age of onset, I should say, of the disease and how big that mutation gets, that expansion in the CAG region. And um, that suggests to me that this is a disease that is biologically modulatable and is something that you can recapitulate in a cellular environment. In other words, you can give a cell a mild form of Huntington disease by putting in a shorter gene and a severe form of Huntington by putting in a longer gene. We really don't know what the right targets are. So drug hunters love targets. They want to know which enzyme should I inhibit? Which receptor should I agonize? Well, we don't know the right answer there. And so for us, screening in a cellular context where all of the appropriate targets are present and the interplay between those different targets can be preserved is really, really important. So those appropriate cell assays are something that are missing from our flow schemes right now. And in fact, we may even want populations of cells. While we know that it's the medium spiny neurons that are the most affected, we don't know whether it's murder or suicide. We don't know whether expression of the Huntington protein in those cells is causing death, or perhaps it's expression of Huntington in another cell type that supports those medium spiny neurons. And so again, stem cells is a really unique opportunity to produce the appropriate set of co cultures to have the right sets of neurons to recapitulate the disease in a petri dish. 
So CHDI, as was mentioned earlier, is a not-for-profit biotech company that is exclusively focused on Huntington disease. And as such, we have the ability to run what most companies don't have the, the luxury of doing, 20 programs in parallel, all on Huntington disease. And I can tell you, without exception, there isn't a program in our portfolio that wouldn't benefit dramatically from having a stem cell-derived cell population in its flow scheme. So this is something that is really critical and that we're shooting in the dark a bit without having uh, that tier within our flow charts. So Hans Kirstad will present these concepts in much better detail and will tell you about some remarkable progress that's already been made in this regard. But the basic idea is to take embryonic stem cells and see if we can push them, do the direct differentiation down a lineage that will give us the cells that we're interested in and see if we can recapitulate that differential cell vulnerability. In other words, when a small Huntington gene is there, it's not affected. When a large Huntington gene is there, it, it is affected. We also want to see if we can leverage some of the population genetics. So people with the same CAG length, with the same mutation, actually have very different ages of onset, suggesting that there are modifier genes. Well, the ability to derive many different stem cell populations from many different backgrounds would give us the ability to figure out what those modifier genes are and to see whether or not those are more tractable drug targets. So not only do we need um, you know, individual stem cell populations, but we actually need several rounds of derivation from several different genetic backgrounds would be really critical for our efforts. So I think, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that there are really several enabling opportunities. And the way we view this is that near term, stem cells will enable our small molecule drug discovery efforts. So we're a modality agnostic shop, though. We're, we don't care what flavor the cure is. We just want to get it as quickly as possible. So while small molecules, pills, that um, we're, we're used to thinking of as drugs, are something that stem cells can enable by providing the right filters and screens, we also think about other ways that stem cells can enable our drug discovery efforts. So it may be that the same cocktail of compounds that folks like Hans and others are able to put in a Petri dish to direct the differentiation of stem cells into medium spiny neurons could themselves be used as drugs to push endogenous progenitor cells to repopulate the portions of the brain that have deteriorated because of Huntington. And it may be that we can change our aspiration from prevent or slow Huntington to actually reverse Huntington disease if the promise of regenerative medicine and cell based therapies come to fruition as well, something that I know that the patients hold great hope for. So I'll just leave you with one quote which comes from a study that was uh, commissioned and funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And basically, to paraphrase it, um, if you started with a blank piece of paper, it would be really difficult to develop a more difficult disease than Huntington disease. Um, it really affects all aspects of the patient's lives, their social interactions, their family, their ability to make a living, their finances, and ultimately um, uh, their next generation and, and, and their own um, their own lifespan. So this is something that um, uh, both scientifically and from a sort of ethical, unmet medical need standpoint, I really can't think of a, a more appropriate application of uh, what we think is a really promising technology. And um, I appreciate everybody's attention.